going through different stories of the Bible that you didn't hear in Sunday school. Um, ones that are not pleasant to read, not pleasant to think about, but ones that God has put in His Word anyways. So what is going on here? Uh, we're going to look at Second Samuel 13 tonight. It's not often that I spend more time on an evening message than I do a morning message, but uh, this week I can safely say that I definitely spent more time on this one than I did on the morning one. This, this was a, a difficult one to, to take on. Second Samuel 13. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and, when, and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, Go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food here into my bedroom so that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, Take this woman out of here and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing a richly ornamented robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornamented robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all of this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister, Tamar. Let's stop there. Now, 
not one of the more pleasant stories of the Bible. And even from David's own family. So what happened? Well, what we didn't read tonight, which happened the chapter just before that, or two chapters before, David had the affair with Bathsheba, and he had her husband killed so that he could have her as his wife. And then the prophet Nathan went to King David, and the prophet Nathan said some startling things to David. One of them said, the sword will never depart from your house. And he also said, this is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. And then we have, after that, at the beginning here, it says, in the course of time, or more literally it would be, after that, this happened. So the Bible is connecting these events. So verses 1 and 2. David's son Amnar falls in love, quote-unquote, with Tamar. Now, the Hebrew word love here is the same word for all kinds of legitimate love that's all throughout the Bible. So at the beginning of the story, it's almost like, oh, okay, what's... What's wrong with that? So, but in the end, as we find out later, like his father, it's, as it says here in the first verse, Amnon, son of David. David the Amnon turns out to be a lot like his father David, where he can't control his own urges. And then verse 6, Amnon devises a plan with the help of uh, a friend of his. He requests Tamar to bring him food. What's interesting is that food here is actually a smoke screen for lust and sexuality. And it's fascinating today that how every once in a while I'll read somebody who in order to justify some sort, of, some sort of lustful thought or action, will compare sex with food as if they're the same thing. You know, the, the body needs it or um, it's nothing special, it's just like shaking hands. Well, they might have a few things in common, but they're very different when it comes to purpose and meaning. They're very different when it comes to purpose and meaning. Verses 7 through 9, Tamar acts honorably, works, help, works hard to help a sick brother. She does the honorable thing. Throughout the whole passage here, she does what? anybody would expect of her. She does the right thing. The king, her dad, says, one of your family members is sick. Would you go help him out? Sure, absolutely. And you notice how in verses 8 and 9, it spends some time describing all of the work that she did. In other words, she put in quite a bit of time to help this brother. Verses 10 through 14. Amnon rapes Tamar despite her protests and struggle. He, you notice, may have noticed there that he said, bring it into my bedroom. And he also said, send everyone out of here. Well, there's sometimes when you might hear somebody say, what goes on in the privacy of my bedroom or so-and-so's bedroom is their own business. Well, that is ridiculous. What goes on behind closed doors is a lot of people's business. 
because what happens behind closed doors affects all of society. And in this case, it ruins lives and destroys families. Verses 15 through 18, Amnon suddenly hates her and throws her out like trash. You'll notice in verse 15 it says, he hated her with intense hatred. The word hatred is used there three times, really driving home that point. It's like he despises her, which now we realize he didn't really care about her at all in any way. He just wanted her body. And his response to her, or what he says, get up and get out, in Hebrew it's just two words. And it's really short, snappy. Up, out. It's like what a heartless guy this is. And his instructions to his servant really just adds insult to injury. Because in verse 17, he called his personal servant. And in the Hebrew, it actually says, Would you please? He says, please, to his servant. But when it says here, this woman, in Hebrew, it literally just says, this. Would you please get this out? So she has become an object to him. Adding insult to injury. So she runs to her brother Absalom. Absalom comforts his sister and takes the matter upon his own heart to relieve her heart. It's not exactly spelled out that way, but in the coming chapters, we would see that that is basically how things played out. He takes the matter upon himself. And in two years, Absalom would kill Amnon because of Tamar. And the fact that coming verses um, where we stopped would cover that. So Absalom sees that justice is done because of his sister. So where is Christ and grace in this story? Where is Christ and grace? The whole Old Testament is supposed to point ahead to Christ. And it's supposed to have the grace of Christ in it. Where is it? Well, first of all, it should be pointed out that Amnon represents everything that sin is. Amnon basically represents everything sin. In fact, just as I was making this list, I don't know if any of you uh, followed the news this week about the uh, Ariel Castro uh, verdict or heard any of the statements that he made in court. It just, it just seemed to go along with this very closely. First of all, sin often seems legitimate. At the beginning, it says he loved her. And that's the same word for love that's used of God. God's love for us. And legitimate love for one another. So, it can seem legitimate. It can start innocently. In fact, Ariel Castro said, if you asked my daughter, she would say, my dad is the best dad in the world. And according to his victim who spoke at the, at the trial, he went to church regularly. So somehow, 
we can get it in our minds that sin is legitimate, that it's okay, that there's nothing wrong with it. And sin consumes us until we are slaves to obsession. Sin has a way of consuming us until we become slaves and obsessed. So where we can't think of anything else. It says in verse 2, he was frustrated to the point of illness. You know, just even entertaining temptations in our heart or in our mind will trigger a process by which it's very hard to reverse. They've done studies where people who have problems with eating, where all they have to see are golden arches, and immediately they need to have french fries. And if somehow they muster up enough willpower to, to not have the french fries, they're so exhausted emotionally from fighting that off that they feel just as bad as if they had gotten the french fries in the first place. And so there's this cycle of, I'm going to feel just as bad if, if I do as if I don't. So sin has a way of consuming us and enslaving us. Sin thrives in secrets and lies. Sin thrives in secrets and lies. If there's something wrong that's going on in your life or in somebody else's life, if you want to keep it going, to lies, keep it a secret. Sin thrives when nobody knows about it and it's not there. There's a reason why there's laws in the books about certain teachers and pastors and such being what we call mandatory reporters, where legally, if I or Deirdre, for that matter, uh, came to some sort of knowledge that a child was being abused, we would be legally required to notify the authorities. Sin sees people as objects or pawns. When we're overcome by sin, we treat people as objects in our game plan. In verse 1, it says she was beautiful. And in verse 2, it says she was a virgin. And he has to trick her. So he basically lies to her. He plays on her good will. And in the Hebrew, it literally says he forces himself on her as if she didn't have any thoughts or feelings at all. And one of the things Ariel Castro said this week, it just baffles me. I'm not a violent person. I simply kept them there without them being able to leave. Sin has a way of messing with our minds, getting us to think things that are, are just bizarre and strange. Sin doesn't listen to reason or consider the outcome. When our minds are in that sinful mode, we're not listening to reason, we're not considering an outcome. We're just going. So, Amnon doesn't even bother to respond to any of the good arguments that she's making. He doesn't even respond to them. When it says such a thing should not be done in Israel, that's basically saying this would be a crime of crimes. This would be a scandal by anybody's standards. disregards it, doesn't even acknowledge it. 
And again, Ariel Castro said, disconnected from reason, kind of in his own world, it said, we had a lot of harmony that went on in that home. Now, what home are you living in? Sin has this way of getting us to think things that aren't true, disconnecting us from reality and just plain old common sense. Sin destroys lives permanently. Sin destroys lives permanently. Tamar says to him in verse 13, What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And then in verse 20, it says she remained a desolate woman the rest of her life. It ruined her entire life. One of Ariel Castro's victims said, I spent 11 years of hell because of you. And lastly, about sin, sin kills the sinner. It doesn't just destroy and hurt other people. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And Amnon paid for this crime with his life. So Amnon is a perfect, I don't say perfect, but he is an ideal picture or a poster child of everything that sin is. And also everything that we are capable of. And we might not do this exact sin, but we definitely can tell tell lies and keep secrets. We definitely can treat people as objects. We definitely can not be reasonable in our minds. We definitely can destroy other people's lives, even inadvertently. Now, like Tamar, God's people have been violated by sin and are unsuitable. Sin means that we are now unholy. God is a holy God. And by sin, that means that we are no longer holy anymore. We are unsuitable to God. Now, as a violated woman, Tamar would no longer be considered marriageable. Nobody would want to consider her to marry her. And especially at that time, purity before marriage was, was everything about your respect and your honor. And even your identity. I mean, it says in a number of places in the Bible, the two become one flesh. This is about identity here. And all the times that marriage or a marriage relationship is used in the Bible for God's love for his church really just makes that connection. So kind of like Tamar, we as the church are unholy and unsuited for God. It says Tamar had to live the rest of her days as a desolate woman. And being unsuited to God is where we are, except Tamar was honorable in her actions while we like our idols and spiritual prostitution, as it's called constantly in the prophets. We have this tendency to go back to our old ways. There was one, one time I remember, this was a little while ago, I was talking to a girl that I knew who was telling me about this boyfriend that she was going to go back to who was not a nice guy. And I remember saying to her, this is the way it is with guys. 
If they do it once, they'll probably do it again. That's usually the way guys work. And that can generally apply to us as, as sinners too. We have a tendency to repeat. But Romans 3, 9, 18, 9 through 18, it says, Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together, together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And that's supposed to be a description of everybody. There's nobody who fits the bill. Not even one. Not even one. So we are not only violated and unsuitable, but we are also promiscuous. As the prophets talk about. And yet, God's love is so great that he still wants us as his bride. We are, sin makes us violated and our continuing in it makes us promiscuous and yet God's love is so great that he still wants us as his bride. So Isaiah 54 says, Do not be afraid, you will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace, you will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. He says, For a brief moment I abandon you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. To me, this is like the days of Noah when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So God is pledging himself to us in spite of what we have done. And he did that through Jesus Christ. Absalom, Tamar's brother, comforted her and he said that he would take the matter to his heart so that she not take it to her heart. Well, Christ, our brother, took upon himself the entire matter of our sin. On the cross, he bore the entire weight of our sin. And Isaiah 49 says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. And then it talks about people are going to come back to you. This is about coming back from exile. And then it says, Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people and those who devoured you will be far away. So, as Amnon said, I'm going to take this upon myself. Don't you worry about it. God kind of says the same thing to us. Don't you worry about it. I'm going to take care of it. I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. And in Christ's case, that was quite literal. Christ's life, death, and resurrection brought justice to our disgrace. So Amnon suggests that he's going to bring justice and he does that 
Amnon, the embodiment of sin, is eliminated. He's gone. And just like Amnon was gone, the cross makes our sin gone. Our disgrace is gone. God's justice came through. And though honorable, Tamar remained a desolate woman. And this seems to be the saddest part of the story, at least for me. Because awful things often happen, but there's no happy ending for her. There's no happy ending. Yet, in Christ, there is no such thing as being desolate. Consider a couple verses. In Christ, there is no desolation. He is everything that we want out of life. And I have a couple verses here. Isaiah 54, 1. Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. That's not the only one. Psalm 113. Who is like the Lord our God? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people, and he settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. In Christ, there is no desolation. If you have Christ in your life, if you belong to him, body and soul and life and death, then you have everything. Somehow, in ways we don't understand, but you have everything that you're looking for already. And we can spend a lifetime discovering more and more about the riches of Christ and what he means. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, you've, you've put some difficult stories in your, your word to us. We want to understand what, what you are trying to say to us. We want to take your word in, into our hearts so that we would not sin against you. We want to live according to your ways. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would, uh, we would always walk in your ways, that, Lord, we would not fear any disgrace, guilt, or shame, that we would trust you with all things, and that, Lord, wherever in our lives, how small or great we might find ourselves desolate, we pray, Lord, that we would find our meaning, satisfaction, and fulfillment in who you are, and by belonging to you. Lord, that's difficult to understand, but please show us what that means. In Jesus' name, amen.